Well, good evening. It is my honor and privilege to welcome you again. If you don't know me, my name is Jason Smith, and I have the awesome honor and privilege of being the pastor here of First Baptist Bernie, and I see so many new faces in the crowd, and what a special service, what a special time of year when families get together, and uh, this is one of my most favorite services. Uh, because you, you get to have the kids read the Christmas story. We get to conclude with a, a candlelight service. And even more than, than all of that, it's, it's a time for you this evening and for me in the midst of all the busyness, all the fun and hustle and bustle, a lot of the good things that occur, okay? Uh, traveling and all that stuff and, and presents and lots of cooking and lots and lots of cooking and sweets and all that stuff, right? to just pause and take a deep breath and really focus, right? Just focus on the Lord this evening. A scripture passage I'm gonna be sharing uh, is out of Luke chapter two. Luke chapter two, the scripture's gonna be on the screen. There's also a Bible in the pew rack in front of you. I'm gonna be sharing the story of Simeon uh, this evening. Luke chapter two, beginning in verse 22. Listen as I read. <clears throat> when the days for their purification, according to the law of Moses, were completed, they brought him up to Jerusalem, presented him to the Lord, as it was written in the law of the Lord. Every firstborn male that opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice according to what was said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. You see, it's been almost a month since the very first Christmas when angels filled the skies over Bethlehem and personally invited the lowly shepherds to come and to see the Son of God, to celebrate the most important event in all of history because hope had come. You see, Mary and Joseph had been displaced and they were without hospitality, presumably due to the shame of their unwed pregnancy. And they were also without means. And so they lay the newborn boy in an animal's feeding trough Church history records for us that Christ was born in a cave. And it's natural for us to presume that they, that they spent the entirety of that first month in a cave. Now, in complete obedience to Leviticus 12, once Mary's time of purification had passed, they journey to present Jesus at the temple in Jerusalem. See, it's the ultimate fulfillment of this requirement of the law. The sacrifice required by the Lord would be a yearling lamb and a dove. Now there is an exception that's given in Leviticus 12 and that is if the family is too poor and cannot afford a lamb, then she can bring a pair of doves. This will be Joseph and Mary's humble offering. Think about this. The eternal sovereign is now being held in the arms of one who is unable to offer a lamb. A public declaration of their poverty. There is no God like our God. Their poverty is a declaration of Come one, come all, come and see what God has done. Because God is no respecter of social status and he does not come to the self-sufficient. Rather, Jesus would say, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. For all those who recognize their need of him, his kingdom is for you. We'll pick up our text again in verse 25. And there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. 
And this man was righteous and devout, looking for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah or Christ. And he came in the spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to carry out for him the custom of the law, then he, that's Simeon, took Jesus into his arms and he blessed God. And he said, now, Lord, you are releasing your bondservant to depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all the people, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. See, Mary and Joseph are forgotten in the crowded temple. They're meagerly dressed. They've had to spend almost every penny to their name to travel and to purchase a pair of doves for a sacrifice. They quietly wait in line to consecrate their firstborn to the Lord. It is a tender, sweet, private moment for this young couple knowing that if no one else sees, God sees. Immediately, they are met by this cheery old man. He rejoices over them. He comes up, he gives them hugs and kisses. He's celebrating. And Mary is taken back by his shouts of excitement. But the man introduces himself as Simeon. And he reveals that the Holy Spirit had told him about this very day. Luke gives us just a few sentences to describe the faithful man of God, that he is righteous and devout. Guys, this means that he loves people and he loves God. Luke also tells us twice that he is led by the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit spoke to him. So think in your mind about the fruit of the Spirit. Someone who even in old age is filled with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. And thirdly, we see that Simeon is filled with an expectancy. He has been waiting for what God is doing. Travel back with me in your mind's eye to a much younger Simeon. There he is on his knees in prayer, and he's begging for God's promises in his life, in his family's life and for Israel as a nation. Now, as you zoom out, you notice that Simeon is almost alone in this prayer. You see, it's been 400 years since Malachi last prophesied about the coming of the Messiah. Think about it, 400 years. God's voice through the prophets had grown silent On top of that, it had been 500 years plus since the last Davidic king ruled and reigned on the throne. No, Israel was a war-torn culture. The Greeks followed by the Romans with only small pockets of peace and independence. Those were followed by waves of oppression. So many sons lost for the cause of war. Women abducted and taken. As I describe the scene, you need to imagine the religious climate of Simeon's day. How few read their Bibles with hope. How many had grown cynical. How dark the culture had become. It seems that they had become a polarized and divided culture. 
On one hand, you had those who compromised and, and, and compromised with everything. They pretty much just joined the Roman culture. And on the other hand, you had those who were rigid and legalistic, so much so that they would not even recognize God himself when he showed up. And amongst that darkness shines Simeon, a man who still believed God's word, was filled with the Holy Spirit and trusted God's character. He was waiting. Friend, have you ever been in a season of waiting on God? You see, when no one else was praying for God's promises, Simeon still had faith. And see him there praying, God, bring about your hope in my life. Bring about your hope to the people that I love. And God, send your Messiah to save your people. Your kingdom come, your will be done. And the Holy Spirit whispered to him, I am sending my son. And you, Simeon, you will see him in your lifetime. Rejoicing, he shared that news with friends and with family and with neighbors, with anyone who would listen. The Messiah is coming. Guys, the Messiah is coming. God has not forgotten. God can be trusted. Trust his word. The Messiah is coming. But as the years passed and Simeon aged, others began to doubt his reliability. Oh, sure, he's a sweet old man. He's the best, really. I mean, he's, he's beloved. He's a pillar in his family. He's so genuine. But he's been saying that the Messiah's coming for years now. And we smile and nod, but come on. Does it really look like God is about to move? Now his stature has been replaced with a stooped profile his hands wrinkled and his skin leathered by the sun. His physical appearance has changed, but his faith has remained steadfast. Let every man be found a liar, but God be found faithful and true. And then one morning, during his morning prayer time, the Holy Spirit leapt in his heart is the day. Go to the temple. Imagine the excitement, the anticipation as he raced, looking upon family after family as he entered there. He had been looking for so long. And then before him stood one of the poorest families of them all, forgotten, like David out with the sheep when, when Jesse was having all of his sons stand before. And Simeon looked upon them and the father whispered, here is my son. Simeon, my salvation, the one that I have sent to die for your sins and to bring about Salvation for all who will place their faith in him. Simeon rushes over, greets them with excitement, scoops the baby up in his arms. And as he stares into the face of the incarnate Son of God, time stands still. The emotions of the moment are too much to express, and a single tear forms in the corner of his eye. He gathers himself, and he begins to pray out loud. Now, Lord, you are releasing your bondservant to depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation 
which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. God's salvation had come in the form of a baby who was destined to die on a cross for your sins. The glory of God and the light of the world. Friend, we spend so much of our time in life waiting for what is ultimately lesser things. Waiting to open presents on Christmas morning. Waiting until we drive. Waiting until we graduate and we get out on our own. Waiting for a spouse or a family. Waiting for that promotion at work for a bigger house and to get some respect. Waiting to retire for the time to do all the things that we want. And friend, how many of those things has the Lord blessed you with? Only for you to find that you still lack contentment. Genuine, deep contentment in your soul. This evening, let Simeon be your light. He waited for God himself, our hope at Christmas, that Jesus has come, that he is living water that satisfies the depth of our soul. So this evening, this Christmas Eve, I want to close and I want to afford you just a brief moment. I know you got kids and they're wiggling and squirming and we're we're done here, but I want to afford you a brief moment. And I want you to meditate on these two verses out of Psalm 130. And I want you to just pray this to the Lord and lead your heart to wait for him. Listen to these two verses, and then you meditate and pray them back to God. I wait for the Lord. My soul does wait. And in his word do I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than the watchman for the morning. Indeed, more than the watchman for the morning. So I'm going to give you about 30 seconds. You prepare your heart. And tell the Father and the Son that you are waiting for him. King Jesus, we we wait for you because you are the lover of our souls. You are the ones that, that, you are the one that fills our hearts, that satisfies the desire of every living thing. We thank you for Simeon's faith. We thank you for his example of waiting and that, that important push for us this evening in the midst of all the busyness and all the fun to wait on you because you satisfy You do satisfy us, Jesus. We love you and we wait for you. Father, if there's anyone here this evening that does not know you as Lord and Savior, I pray right now in Jesus' name that they would hear the good news and the call that you have sent your son for them so that that they would know you. And Father, right now, they cry out in faith and receive you as their savior. We pray all of this in Jesus' name, amen.